Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Katie Spoden. I'm an assistant director over at the Polsky Center at the University of Chicago. The Polsky Center is the university's uh, Department for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Um, today, we are happy to have Eric Severinghaus with us today, and he is going to be talking about mental health for entrepreneurs, obviously a very important topic um, for entrepreneurs, and especially in this stressful time of the pandemic, this is really a topic that we want to um, have a conversation with you all about. Um, in terms of Q&A, um, you can put your questions in the chat box, and I will just keep an eye on those. Um, and I can ask Eric those questions on your behalf, but there will also be some time at the end of the presentation for some questions as well. Um, with that, Eric, I will toss it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Katie. I, I really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody for joining. I know the last thing in the world anybody really wants is another Zoom meeting on their calendar. And so it's it's an honor to me that you guys are taking time um, you know, out of your day, out of your evening. Uh, to participate in something like this, and hopefully it's going to be valuable and, um, and, and you know, a good investment of your time. My name is Eric Severinghaus. Um, I'm going to, I guess I'll get into a little bit of kind of who I am here. Um, so I've, I've seen kind of every, every part of the entrepreneurial journey. I, I started a company called Simple Relevance and, uh, you know, ended up winning some awards, getting to ring the NASDAQ bell, I've had a couple of very nice exits. Um, I was fortunate enough when I was in college to help start a company called Eye Contact that we sold for $189 million and then um, was part of the executive team at Spring CM as we, a couple of years ago, sold that to DocuSign for about $225 million. So I, I've seen the highest of the highs of, of the entrepreneurial journey. Um, and we'll get into this in a little bit, but I've also seen the highest of the highs of the world, literally. Uh, I actually climbed Mount Everest uh, two years ago in 2018. This is a picture of me atop the world waving the uh, iconic Chicago Cubs W flag. Um, and the reason that you see it up there on the, uh, on, on the Jumbotron at Wrigley Field is because I was also invited to throw out a first pitch at the Cubs game. So you know, I've, I've really seen about the highest points that there are on both the business journey as well as kind of mountaineering. The flip side of this and, and you know, the part that not many entrepreneurs talk about and, and not many people who go through this journey really talk about is that climbing Mount Everest was the second hardest thing I've ever done. And despite, you know, literally crawling on ladders over multiple hundred foot crevasses, um, it wasn't even close to being the closest that I've ever felt to dying. And, and really at the end of the day, the first was being an entrepreneur. My time in the entrepreneurial journey came much closer to killing me than my time atop the highest and one of the most dangerous mountains in the world. The other side of my background, and, and most entrepreneurs have stuff like this, but not many people will talk about it. The other side of my background is that I've had a dozen companies that have failed and shut down for something close to zero. Um, I've been laid off or fired, whatever you want to call it, twice. Um, I had a failed engagement during this journey that was heartbreaking and very challenging. The, the entrepreneurial journey in many ways has, has cost me an awful lot as well. Almost, the research shows, and we'll get into this in depth, that almost all entrepreneurs go through these same types of challenges. For you guys that are interested in being entrepreneurs or perhaps are active entrepreneurs, some part of this is going to happen to you. It's, it's almost guaranteed. Um, but, you know, very rarely, and this is why I'm so excited that the University of Chicago and the Polsky Center have asked me to come talk about this, is so rarely do folks actually talk about what it takes to persevere through these challenges and then ultimately put yourself in a position to succeed. And, um, and so that's really the conversation that I want to have. I'm going to try and get through what is about 10 hours of content and an entire book very, very quickly and give you guys the Cliffs Notes. Um, I do invite you, please, please, please put questions into that chat window. Katie's going to keep me honest and interrupt me here with any questions or clarifications. This is so much more interesting as dialogue than it is, than it is as monologue. I love talking with you guys, not at you guys. Uh, the unfortunate reality is it's just hard to do with Zoom. So anyway, put questions in and, and let's turn this into a dialogue. There are five key things that I want to talk to you about. And, and, you know, Katie introduced this as a mental health thing. Mental health is the bucket 
that we so often put this into. I personally don't describe it as mental health as much. Um, I talk about it in terms of mental resilience a lot. The importance of being resilient to the challenges, um, the importance of, of how to maintain decision making, uh, d d maintain candidly human happiness despite a lot of the challenges. So I'm going to talk a little bit about mental resilience, what I think it is, and why I think it's the most important quality for entrepreneurial success. I'm going to talk a little bit about the psychology behind it, as well as the physiology behind it. I'm going to let you guys in on what I think is a whole bunch of really bad advice that gets circulated in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now that I'm probably going to call bullshit on a lot of the advice that you guys have other people get in front of you and talk to you about. So, you know, take it as Eric Severinghouse's point of view. Um, but, but there's a lot of bad advice, I think, circulating out there that's toxic for both companies and entrepreneurs. And I'm going to tell you why I, I believe that to be true. And then I'm going to give you some really specific suggestions around preparation. Um, the unfortunate reality of this talk, I shouldn't say it's unfortunate because I think it's, it's, the only way to do it well. We're going to spend probably about uh, about 50% of the time on the problem and then you know about 50% of the time on the solution. Uh, if you get into my book, it skews a little bit more towards solutions. It's probably about 30% problem, 70% solution. Um, but I do think it's, it's important and transformational to really define the problem so that you guys understand what you're going to be going through or perhaps what you already are going through. Um, and then we'll get into, like I said, some tactical kind of preparation and advice. All right. Any questions about any of that, Katie? We're still clear. I'm going to be I'm looking so at far, you Eric. Nod and thumbs up. All right, cool. <laughs> All right. So I believe resilience to be the most critical entrepreneurial skill that there is. It's rarely taught, but I think it's the most important thing out there. If you look at all of the research, and I've got probably a couple dozen papers on this. Um, if, if you look at all the research, it shows that as entrepreneurs, we need to prepare ourselves for at least an eight-year journey. If we go read TechCrunch, if we go read, you know, the anecdotes, it can so often seem like this is, you know, a, a, entrepreneurship's a way to get rich quick. All of the research that's out there shows that it's an eight-year journey. Now, as you go through Polsky's curriculum, as you go and listen to entrepreneurial talks, as you read all of the advice that's out there, there's two types of advice that you'll get as an entrepreneur. One type of advice is how to succeed faster, how to take whatever it is you're doing and how to make it happen more quickly so that you get to the, the, those riches and that success. That's where I think 90 to 95% of entrepreneurial advice falls into. And I've, I've, I've listened to all of it. I've read all of it. I've read all the books. I've watched all the movies. Um, how to succeed faster. I'm going to focus on what I think is very rarely talked about which is how to prepare yourself and your company for the eight year journey. The reality is no matter how much we try to accelerate for all of the great advances that we've made in entrepreneurial education in the last 20 years, things like customer blueprint and lean startup and crossing the chasm and all this other good stuff. The reality is it hasn't changed the fundamental fact that it's still at least eight years to succeed in an entrepreneurial context. And so I'm gonna focus a lot on how to, be, how to prepare yourself to succeed for that eight years. The other thing that you guys should know, if you're interested in being an entrepreneur, is that the current state of the entrepreneurial industry is one of crisis. 75% of venture-backed companies fail. Most venture capital funds return less uh, on a liquidity-adjusted basis than the S&P 500. There are poor economic outcomes all over the place in this field. Perhaps even more importantly, and for me, what was even more sobering, I knew all of those stats when I got into entrepreneurship. They haven't really changed much over the years. What I didn't understand were many of the human outcomes of, that, that being an entrepreneur creates. Uh, there's some great research out there by a good friend of mine, Dr. Michael Freeman. Um, you can see a link down at the bottom. Entrepreneurs have three times the rate of substance abuse, twice the rate of suicidality. You can go down through the list of poor mental health outcomes and entrepreneurs dramatically over index versus the rest of the population. So let's talk about why this is the case. Let's talk about the psychology of entrepreneurship. 
Um, if, if we were sitting in a classroom, I would ask you guys who's ever heard of the learning curve. Most of you guys would raise your hand. We would all agree that it's fairly intuitive, which is that like over time, as you learn how to do a task, you get better at that task, right? And and typically, it, it, it the very earliest of it is kind of the steepest part of the learning curve. You learn the most when you have the most to learn. And then over time, it kind of levels off. Um, but, but over time, you get better at the thing that you're trying to learn how to do. Now, if I asked you who's heard of Dunning-Kruger and, and sort of the, the, the perception curve of competence, my guess is one or two of you might raise your hand, but it would be far less well-known. But there's been a ton of studies out there, and, and the most famous ones um, are, are by a parapsychologist parapsych named Dunning and Kruger. And what they show is that in contrast to the learning curve, there, when, if you ask somebody how good at doing something do you think that you are, we may at the very beginning say we're not very good. But really, really quickly, we decide that we're experts. Like as soon as we solve the first couple little problems of it, we think, oh, sweet, we're really good at this. Like this, this thing wasn't all that hard. It's no problem at all. And then over time, we actually start to understand why a particular problem is so hard. And we get a little bit more humility around some of the things that we don't know. And so what oftentimes happens is our confidence drops before it eventually starts to build back again. And, and so if you think about this um, in an entrepreneurial context, when we first start being entrepreneurs, we oftentimes go into this and we think, oh, this isn't so hard. I don't get why everybody thinks this is tough. I'm going to go solve these problems. I'm going to go raise a ton of money. Um, I know I certainly went through this thinking um, I'm going to need to raise one round of capital um, and, and then we'll take this business and we'll grow like crazy. The and, and, and so the sort of height of this curve, the place where we think we understand the most, even though we understand very little, uh, is, is what's oftentimes called the peak of Mount Stupid. Um, and, and so this is what I call the delusions of grandeur phase. It's this idea that we think we're really good at something, even if we may or may not actually be good at that thing yet. There's another part of, of this journey um, so if you think about it, if I overlay the learning curve and how good we're actually getting with this perception curve of how good we think we are, at the very beginning, we think we're much better than we actually are. And then over time, we get better at this thing. Remember that learning curve, but our confidence actually erodes. And this is the part where things get to be really, really dangerous because this is the part where we oftentimes feel like we're not good at what we're doing. We feel like we're an imposter. We feel like we shouldn't be even be doing this, even as we might be empirically getting better at being an entrepreneur. Um, and these things happen in waves and they, and they happen over and over and over again. The, the low point of this, the, the place where we might actually be doing a good job, but we certainly don't feel like we are, um, is what I call the death zone of imposter syndrome. And, and imposter syndrome is a fairly well understood term. Um, it's this idea of us not thinking that we're as good at, at doing something as we actually might be. So when you're in that delusions of grandeur phase, there's a few very specific things that start to happen. We underestimate the difficulties that lay ahead of us. We oftentimes disregard really useful advice. And we become very sensitive and upset because we have this perception of ourselves as being really good at something. Um, and, and if we're not quite there yet, our ego doesn't, doesn't like hearing that. Um, and, and so I know for me, when I was starting out, I thought that, you know, any VC that wouldn't invest in my business, they were stupid or they were biased or they, you know, they didn't understand, um, you know, employees that didn't want to come work for me were, were you know, similarly dumb. Um, and, and, and so I didn't have enough humility around sort of where I was in the journey and how much I had to learn. And then when you get into the, the elements of imposter syndrome, this is where, and we'll go deeper into all of this, but this is where it gets even, even deeper and even more visceral. There's this joylessness that often sets in. We feel like we're a failure and, and we, we don't even feel like we have the right to be happy. That often manifests itself in different forms of depression. Um, and what becomes even more challenging, I, I think in some ways, is that our decision-making is dramatically impaired. There are studies out there that show that we're under stress and, and, and when we're going through uh, those sorts of events, we're not nearly as good at processing information and we're not nearly as good at making decisions. We'll get into that in more depth here in a minute. 
And oftentimes this leads to quitting. Um, it, it's oftentimes this feeling of imposter syndrome that actually leads us to hang up and, and decide that we're not going to be entrepreneurs uh, before we get to that to, to those plateaus of success. So my favorite example of this, I need to move my screen out of the way here. My favorite example of this, this was an interview given, I think about four years ago now, um, by Elon Musk. And, and so, you know, obviously this guy is, you know, I, I think would rightly be considered one of the great innovators of all time. And he gave an interview to the New York Times where they were asking him how he was doing. And he told the New York Times, the paper of record for this country, this past year has been the most difficult and painful year of my career. It was excruciating. I've had friends who come by who are really concerned. It is often a choice of no sleep or Ambien. If you have anyone who can do a better job, please let me know. They can have the job. Is there someone right now who can do the job better? They can have the reins right now. And to me, this is, this is just such an amazing statement. It's, it's, the, it's a fantastic encapsulation of that idea of imposter syndrome. Here you've got probably one of the smartest and, and probably one of the most self-assured people, uh, at least from his public persona, that, that kind of exists out there in the world. Again, telling the New York Times, he doesn't oftentimes feel like he should be doing the job. He doesn't really want to do the job. He's having trouble sleeping. Um, you know, friends very concerned, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, the reason that I say this and I lay it out this way is, is just to make sure that everybody understands. Like, these are problems that I went through. Um, you know, I, I personally suffered from substance abuse issues. I suffered from depression. There were times where I contemplated suicide. There were times when I really wanted all of the pressure that I felt like I was carrying to come to an end. Um, you know, you can see what Elon Musk goes out and says publicly. Uh, God only knows what he says privately to his friends when they're asking him about that. Um, so again, this is something that, that it really affects everybody who goes through this journey. And you can expect to experience some component of this if you continue to decide you want to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to talk quickly about the physiology of being an entrepreneur. Um, this is a, a scene from a movie, a guy getting ready to fight a bear. Um, many of us literally, when we even see this picture, um, my guess is if I had a heart rate monitor on all of you, like your heart rate probably ticked up just a few beats, just literally from seeing this picture come onto your screen. And certainly this guy who's getting ready to, you know, kill a bear or die trying, um, his heart rate is off the charts. His cortisol levels are off the charts. His adrenaline levels are off the charts. His body has been finely tuned for through millennia of evolution to be ready for this fight against a bear. He is ready to either, you know, perform the greatest combat he's ever performed in his life, die trying, or potentially flee if necessary. Um, but it's important to note that all of us have really evolved from ancestors. We aren't that far removed from our ancestors for whom this sort of survival was, was necessary. Um, you know, th th this was how our bodies have evolved to respond to stress and to anxiety and to the perception of danger is when we see this bear, when we see this thing that we view as dangerous, our heart rate skips up immediately. Our, our, our brain starts dumping uh, chemicals uh, from our in endocrine system into our, um, into our bloodstream. So things like uh, uh, cortisol and adrenaline. And we're literally ready to fight or flee as though our lives depend on it. Um, you know, the thing that I like to say is we are, whether we realize it or not, whether we like it or not, we are the product of our most paranoid and anxious ancestors. Somewhere in, in, in our past, we had ancestors who were more Buddhist, you know, monk-like, who saw that bear and sat down and decided to meditate. And most of those ancestors got eaten by the damn bear, right? And, and so it was these people who were ready to fight, ready to flee, uh, who ended up surviving, reproducing, and creating folks like you and me. So again, our, our bodies respond in very predictable ways to stress and the perception of danger. Uh, we don't sleep because that would be dangerous and could get us killed. Our anxiety levels go off the charts. Um, there's loneliness. Uh, one of the more interesting kind of things that I find happens so often with entrepreneurs is 
um, I, I thought it was only me for a long time. I developed this kind of eye twitch and I didn't realize it until I was talking to another friend of mine who told me that he could tell his body was under tremendous stress because his eye had started twitching. And I realized that mine had too. Um, uh, we, we respond by changing our eating patterns, our exercise patterns, oftentimes um, our brains like to seek equilibrium. And so we oftentimes try to medicate with substances. Um, if, if we don't take care of ourselves as we go through some of this, this stress accumulates over time. Um, and in, in many cases, we, it can end up with psychic breaks. It can end up, um, I've had friends who have had to be institutionalized uh, because of this. They literally wake up and forget who they are. Um, we're talking at the age of 30. I've known people that, you know, they were afraid they suffered strokes. Um, I've known people who have had heart attacks in their 20s and 30s. Um, this type of stuff, unfortunately, happens. Uh, and, and perhaps the most dangerous of all of this is suicidality. Um, the, the unfortunate reality to the way our bodies respond to stress is we're very, very well calibrated to handle acute stress. We're very, very well calibrated to handle that bear popping up and figuring out how we deal with it. What our bodies did not evolve to handle well is chronic stress. And so we identify these stressors in much the same way. Our hearts and our minds respond in much the same way. But over time, those stresses actually accumulate and, and they wear down um, our, our psychology and, and they wear down literally our bodies. Um, and, and, and so there is unfortunately a whole raft of symptoms that, that we can very much expect to experience as we go through this journey. The other unfortunate reality is our minds, um, because of the way that they've evolved to handle that acute stress of that bear attacking us, um, we don't necessarily make good decisions as we're going through all of this. Decision-making was less important. Response was, was kind of the more important. Response time was the more important variable. And so we literally get tunnel vision where um, if, if you actually measure uh, the, the peripheral vision of people that are undergoing an, uh, a, a stress incident, you'll find that their vision literally narrows as they focus on the thing immediately in front of them. Um, our, our, the cognitive part of our brain, the, the higher level thinking parts of our brain, blood flows away from that and it flows um, into the amygdala and into the more emotional and responsive areas of the brain. So we don't process information very well and we become uh, very emotional. Uh, Decision-making is oftentimes impaired. And the unfortunate reality is that we actually become far less ethical in these sorts of situations. Um, the, the sort of evolutionary psychology behind it is that we oftentimes had to be ready to do bad things in order to survive. And what you actually see is when human beings are under substantial stress, um, they tend to act in a, in a manner that's far less ethical, putting themselves in, you know, at risk of criminal charges and, and just candidly doing things that they regret. So there's a lot that happens as, as we're kind of going through and our bodies are going through um, many of those stress responses. The, the thing that I never understood as an entrepreneur when I was going through my stress responses, I, I would read about other entrepreneurs and think those guys are strong and I'm weak. Like I could feel that I wasn't sleeping very well. I could feel that, that my, my mind was kind of changing, but I always kind of thought of it as a strong versus weak thing. Um, and, and what my research and what learning since the journey has really taught me is this isn't about strong versus weak. It's not like there is some class of strong and tough people that don't go through this. And if your body experiences these physiological reactions, it makes you somehow weak or, or less than. This is just simply the way our bodies have evolved to respond to stress. And so for the longest time, I kind of denied it. And I said, nah, that can't be true. Like I'm, I'm probably, you know, it's all in my mind. I judged myself really harshly for going through a lot of this. And what I've since learned to kind of think about and internalize is like, this is just natural. It's just part of being a human being. It's, it's what has, you know, been passed down in the DNA and I can either pretend it's not there and I can get kind of silly around ignoring it, or I can recognize that these things exist and I can create coping and response mechanisms to try to better sort of confront it and deal with it. Um, before I go on to, well, no, I'm gonna go on to the next part and then I'll stop for a couple questions in case there are any. This is usually a part where somebody wants to talk about something. So, um, 
I've, I've, I've talked so far, I'm about halfway into uh, to my time here. I've talked so far about how this relates to us as entrepreneurs. But there's another dynamic here that I think is so important, which is that as we are going through this journey, our team members, our family members, other people around us are going through this journey as well. And we know that, that one, of the, you know, one of the side effects of the stress that entrepreneurs go through is that we tend to become more inwardly focused. Um, and, and we tend to think about ourselves and some of the challenges that we're experiencing. Um, I, I will tell you that probably my greatest regret as an entrepreneur was that when I was going through my challenging times, I became a lot more focused on me and a lot less focused on how do I support my team? How do I support my co-founders? How do I support the other executives that are going through this with me? Uh, there's a fascinating study that shows that when people uh, decide to go be entrepreneurs, their spouses actually uh, start taking um, uh, the medication, mental health medication, antidepressants and others at a rate that is higher than the entrepreneur. So there is actually research out there showing that for many of us, the stress that we might be vicariously and unintentionally passing along to our loved ones, our friends, our family, our professional colleagues might even have a greater effect on them than it's having on us. Eric, um, I wanna jump in with a question yeah, because I, I think that's super fascinating. Um, do you think that the reason for that, or maybe the study mentioned this, is you were saying that when you were going through this, you were telling yourself, oh, I can deal with this. This isn't a big deal, blah, blah, blah. And is it maybe that the spouse or partner is seeing something that that entrepreneur is maybe just like keeping them to themselves or not, you know, verbalizing? This, I'm just curious this, the study talked about that. Yeah, the study didn't get into correlation versus causation. And so there's all kinds of confounding variables that may exist. I, I can tell you the Eric Severinghouse's personal opinion based on an awful lot of anecdotes. Um, well, and, and some data. So uh, if you go read Dr. Michael Freeman's research, you will find that most of us that decide to go down the entrepreneurial journey are kind of mentally and psychologically predisposed to go do this kind of thing. Um, we, th there, there tend to be all sorts of markers uh, around our personality types and, and around our neurology that predispose us, some of them positive and some of them negative, candidly, um, in terms of, you know, things like impulsiveness and, and stuff that, that, that leads to, you know, many people have ideas to go start a business. There's a certain type of person that doesn't just have the idea, but they actually quit their day job and decide to go start the damn business, right? And those people tend to be impulsive. They tend to have all kinds of other markers and all kinds of other kind of mental elements associated with them. To some extent, we might be better prepared for the journey that we decide to go lead than those people around us. Many of our wives and husbands and spouses and partners and kids may or may not have necessarily signed up to go on that journey, but we, we end up unintentionally, vicariously sort of transferring that stress to them. No matter how much we may try not to, it's just a fact of life and it just happens. And so I think oftentimes they may be less prepared for the journey that, that we're going on than, than we may even be. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'd love to talk about that more, but yeah. I know we don't have time. Um, there was a question that was raised in the chat really quick before you get started on your next Please. section. What scenarios might heighten or dampen these psychological and physiological responses to stress? For example, maybe this person has started a business before, would that dampen their response or yeah with an investor when maybe that's your first time working with, with an investor and that might heighten your response. So I guess like what level does a person's prior experiences take into account? Yeah, I, I love that question. Um, so the, when if you had showed me that Dunning-Kruger model when I started Simple Relevance, I started Simple Relevance about 10 years ago. 
at that point, I had probably started about a dozen companies um, prior to that. And again, I'd, I'd had a couple successes and I'd had a, you know, a number of failures. Um, so I would have looked at that and I would have said, yeah, hey, you know what? Like, I've, I've already done this. Like, I get it. I've, I've, I've lived the stresses. I understand what it is. Like, I'm, I'm ready for this, right? And what was different with Simple Relevance is it was the first time I was a CEO who had raised millions of dollars. I was on the cover of magazines. I was, you know, ringing the NASDAQ bell, you name it. And, and, and so there's no doubt that prior experience going through this stuff can help mitigate some of that risk. Like things are always harder the first time you see them. But what, what also happens is you can have gone through it before, but now if you're going through it at a higher level or if it's more heightened, if you have more pressure on you, um, things of that nature uh, can also continue to trigger it. There's all kinds of predispositions that we may have. There's certain people that are predisposed to things like anxiety, depression. Um, and, and, and so those can exacerbate it for sure. Um, it, it, having been through it before, I think can be a mitigating factor. Um, but again, it's only so, so valuable as a mitigating factor. Like it can still kind of strike at any time. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, um, it's a great question. I don't know that I have an exhaustive answer to it other than to say, um, you know, there's I, what, what I think is so important is to understand that it's something that can strike and, and it builds over time. And, and so understanding like how to recognize it, how to sort of understand that the symptoms are happening and then figure out how to deal with it, I, I think is, is kind of the key element. I don't think anybody's immune to it. Um, you know, if, if you guys um, if, if you guys read about the the tragedy of, of Tony Shea and you know from Zappos, and and you know the unfortunate reality once you start studying mental health and mental resilience and entrepreneurs, is that you see this shit every few months. It's like clockwork. There's some sort of high profile founder that ends up having some sort of a, a terrible outcome, and um, you know Tony was a guy that and, and I, I never met Tony. I don't know him personally. But you look at it, the guy had a great outcome. Um, you know, he had, he had a nice role at Amazon. He had more money he could have, than he could have ever ask for, right? In many ways, you would have thought that he would have been past a lot of this. And it still sort of reared its head much later in life um, in a way that obviously just led to an absolutely tragic outcome for him. So, so it's, it's, it's something to say that like, it's, it's something I, I think you've always got to be aware of and, and wary of no matter what. I think we got a question up too. Hi, Eric. Uh, thank you. Know, thank you so much. And maybe you're going to get to this. I was just kind of curious um, how you do a, you know, how do you sort of do in a regimented way, keep tabs on the people around you and make sure they're doing well too, like your co-founders or whatever. You know. Yeah. Um, I, I, absolutely. So I wouldn't say that I do it. I wouldn't say use regimented is the word. Um, for me, so I was the opposite when I was an entrepreneur. I modeled an awful lot of bad behavior. I was living the do more faster, grind harder, you know, be in at 7 a.m., you know, leave the office at midnight, um, kind of bad behavior. And, and I wish I hadn't, but, but I did. Um, nowadays, as an entrepreneur or as an executive leading teams, it's a lot more for me about being open with the, the teams that I lead. Like I, I tell my teams that I go see a therapist every week and I'm, you know, don't, don't have any shame around that. Um, you know, I, I, I check in with my teams around just asking how they're doing. Um, just, just honestly like bringing up the topic and just saying, you know, again, the idea that it's okay not to be okay. It's okay to have bad days. Uh, I think a lot of us are grappling this with this as we go through the pandemic of, you know, let's just be honest a little bit more honest with each other. It doesn't mean you don't need to show up and be professional, um, but let's be honest with each other around how we're doing and, and around how we can help one another. So, you know, for me, it, it comes down to modeling good behavior, making sure to not model bad behavior, resisting my impulse to send my team emails at midnight or at 6 a.m. or, at, you know, like blasting them with stuff to do over the weekend, all of that kind of thing. Um, and then just checking in with them as a human being, asking them how they're doing, encouraging them to take breaks, and, and being a little bit intuitive, like just understanding when 
they seem to be at their end of the rope and, uh, and, and figuring out ways to kind of intervene and be helpful to them. All right, there, there's one other thing that I wanna to touch on here. Um, I, I kind of did a little bit of, of how this can kind of trigger at any time. Uh, so one of, the, one of the stressors going back to your question, Katie, no doubt is financial stress, financial pressure. Feeling like you're under financial pressure um, you know, can, can just be brutal. I mean, it's brutal for anybody to feel like you, you can't figure out how to make ends meet. Um, and then I, I think it compounds even more when you have people that you care about that have invested in you and you're afraid you're going to lose money from people that, that you built a relationship with or maybe friends or family. Um, I, I think it's even more brutal than when you have employees and you know that their livelihoods depend on you. I know for me, when I was staring into the abyss of failure at Simple Relevance, the idea that I was going to have to, you know, lay off my team, no longer be able to pay their salaries, not be able to pay back my friends and family who invested in me. Like that was the stuff that kept me up at night. It wasn't my own personal bankruptcy. It was all the people that I felt like believed in me, trusted me, depended on me. And I was going to let those people down with my failure. That was the thing that I just, oh God, I had the hardest time processing. The other thing that can then happen, um, even after an exit, and, and, and this absolutely happened to me, it's happened to many entrepreneurs I know, is you, you get to an exit. Usually when we exit, there's some kind of a positive financial outcome. We either make some money or at least we stop losing money. And so there's, there's an awful, like there's something financially that usually happens at an exit that causes the exit that, that should make us feel better. And we so often, you know, I, I think, you know, there, there ought to be a syndrome associated with this, like founder post-exit syndrome or something. It, we so oftentimes that can actually be the triggering event, which for many entrepreneurs makes us even feel worse than we might have in the hardest times during the grind. There's this ennui that, that sort of happens. Um, I learned that word as I was studying and trying to figure out how I felt. Um, this, this idea of listlessness, feeling unimportant. Uh, many of those chemicals that have been coursing through our bloodstream, the adrenaline and the cortisol and everything else now kind of goes away because we don't have that danger. And so it leaves us in this weird um, kind of lifeless state. And, and there's, again, kind of chemical reasons behind that. Uh, if you do make money on the exit, it's weird how little happiness that money equates to. Because what happens, we oftentimes start the company because we want to solve all these problems. And then somewhere the money kind of becomes the driving force of it, even though we don't want it to be. And then you end up making money and the money doesn't actually make you any happier. And that, that is this really weird thing to kind of come to terms with. The other thing, and I know this happened for me is um, when we're going through the journey and we may not be feeling great, we may not be sleeping well, we might be frustrated, anxious, stressed. At least we kind of have this thing that we can always say, oh, this is why I don't feel good is because my company is either struggling or challenging or you know it's stressing me out, right? So I have this thing and I can use that to kind of pin all of my negative emotions on this external thing. And then what happens is that thing goes away and we can no longer blame you know, the, some of the toxicity that might exist on this external thing. And we kind of have to look in the mirror and go, oh shit, this is our problem to deal with. Um, and, and so there's a lot of these kinds of things that can then happen, uh, you know, even as you go through an exit. Um, all right, we're going to get into solutions. We're going to get into some of the happy stuff here. I promise it's not all darkness, doom and gloom. Um, I do need to do one more quick thing, though, because I need to help inoculate you folks from this $13 billion entrepreneurship industry. So there is a $13 billion industry of people trying to tell you folks how to be entrepreneurs, okay? And yes, I'll raise my hand and say that at the point where my book gets published, I'm pointing at the book section on this. Um, at the point where my book gets published, I will be a card carrying member of this. Um, but there's conferences and expos and all kinds of stuff, right? This is actually one of the fastest growing industries. It's growing at something like 40% year over year, which is insane growth for an industry. Like there is a massive industry of people to tell entrepreneurs how to be entrepreneurs. And the problem is that studies have shown the more time you spend listening to these people, the more time that entrepreneurs spend getting advice from the advice industry, the less amount of time your company is likely to survive. 
So the more you spend listening to entrepreneurial advice, the less amount of time your company is likely to survive. Remember, studies show that in order to get to a successful outcome, you've probably got to spend eight years building your company. If your company is less likely to survive, you know, the number of years your company is less is, is likely to survive goes down, the more time you spend listening to the entrepreneurial advice industry, it kind of begs the question of why, I think. And when I read this study, and there's a variety of studies that, that back these assertions up, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Man, there are so many people out there giving entrepreneurs shitty advice that is counterproductive to your outcomes. Now, why is that? In order for entrepreneurs to succeed, much of what you guys need to do is to figure out how to take volatility out of your business. You want to de-risk your outcomes and de-risk your journey as much as possible. But most of the people that get invited to give entrepreneurs advice are people for whom volatility has been a good thing. I could, spend, I could spend hours with you explaining the venture capital model, their two and 20 fee, fee structure, and why it is misaligned to entrepreneurial outcomes. But I'll simply tell you that, that for me, it's as easy as 75% of the companies they invest in fail. When VCs are writing checks, they are expecting the median outcome to be failures and zeros. They hope to, ha they hope to perform for their limited partners because they're going to have a few really big successes. Their model is to give some money, inject a shitload of volatility into the companies in their portfolio. Never mind the fact that 75% of them fail, we're going to write them off. The 25% that succeed, they're the ones that are going to return outsized capital to their investors. All right. Reporters. A uh, quick point of clarification in yeah. the chat. Um, do you define a successful outcome for a business solely as a sale? Um, could it not also be defined as a business that you can work on for the next 20 years and make payroll? I love that question. 10,000%. Um, there are an awful lot of ways to define success or failure for a business. Honestly, I define, I, I would call my time. So I'm, I'm wearing a shirt that says failed entrepreneur, right? Um, I have, I have, built plenty of companies that have not returned capital back to investors in a meaningful sense. Many of those companies still built great products for customers, created great human outcomes, you know, for our employees. There are a ton of different dynamics to, to evaluate success or failure besides return on capital to investors. I am, um, and, and, and it's something that, that I go deep on and I poke at pretty hard in the book. I'm using, so I, I'd like to put failed in air quotes every time and just get annoying if I kept saying failed. Um, and, and, and yes, exactly to your point. I'm also kind of conflating entrepreneurship as a big broad category with sort of venture backed high growth entrepreneurship. And those are very, very different things. Um, to whoever's asked the question, like I am actually fascinated with the idea of how to build longstanding resilient businesses that survive you know, for not even just dozens of years, but perhaps hundreds of years. I think those are fascinating challenges to think about and solve. Um, so I'm, I'm being a little bit glib and a little bit cliche here to just kind of try and make a point. Um, reporters who are all also oftentimes, uh, you know, key folks giving entrepreneurs advice, whether they should be or not. We, we all learn a lot from the media and they, they tend to talk to us a lot. They also love volatility, right? Because the only thing that drives more page views then stories of huge successes are stories of outsized failures and, and companies that crash into the ground. And so, you know, from a reporter's perspective, volatility is a great thing. Um, going back to your question, Katie, God, there's so much that I'd love to talk about on this question. This, this could be another hour long chat. Um, but the, the part of what the entrepreneurial advice industry conditions us to think as entrepreneurs is that if we don't grow it quickly and create that fast kind of almost flip outcome, that massive outsized exit, that it's a failure. And, and people denigrate, you know, you, you, the word lifestyle business is used to talk about entrepreneurs oftentimes building sustainable companies. 
in, in a way that makes it sound like it's it's like um I, I don't know I, I don't even know how to describe, like a semi retirement sort of thing to actually build a sustainable company not on the venture flip model so whoever's asking that question absolutely please keep that radar and that filter up because you're going to hear a lot of advice that's going to condition you to think that the only way to build a company is is to build it you know in, in the venture model and, and to flip it um the the final the final thing to be aware of is you guys are going to hear from a lot of successful entrepreneurs uh, who are going to come tell you how they were successful. What you very rarely are going to hear from are failed entrepreneurs. You are very rarely going to hear from entrepreneurs um, who will get up and will tell you about the companies that went to zero and why they went to zero and what that did to them and how they felt during that, during that phase of the journey. So there is tremendous selection bias in terms of who is asked and who is invited to come speak to entrepreneurs. The folks for whom extreme volatility paid off, oftentimes really just because they got lucky, but for whom extreme volatility paid off and ended up with an outsized exit, those are the ones that are over-indexed in terms of getting invited to come speak. The brilliant, hardworking, um, every bit as tough and gritty and hardcore entrepreneurs who didn't get lucky and their companies failed, right? However, we want to define that. Those folks are invited far less to come speak to entrepreneurs. Um, and, and so the lessons that we learn are all are, are, are sort of tinged through this selection bias of who gets invited to come speak. That's, that's part of why I put my shirt on and come say, hey, look, you want to see what a failed entrepreneur looks like? You know, this is one. All right, terrible advice. I'm just checking. Oh, shit, I got nine minutes. All right, I'm going to go quick through this. Um, hustle harder, grind harder, do more faster. Um, I went through Techstars. I love Techstars. I have told Brad Feld and David Cohen more times than I can count how toxic I think this advice is. Um, it's, it's just terrible advice. And when you hear it, please disregard it. Um, Ben Horowitz, I've never met Ben. I think Ben has a lot of great ideas. Um, I think that he really gets it wrong when he wrote, writes in, in this poem called The Struggle, uh, which, which is sort of a, a, a very um, popular way of talking about kind of the entrepreneurial grind. The struggle is not failure, but it causes failure, especially if you are weak, always if you are weak. Most people are not strong enough. There is so much advice out there that equates strength or weakness with your willingness to take on irrational risk and it is just a bullshit message. I could go on forever for all the reasons I think it's a terrible message. Um, but but uh, let me tell you, there is nothing weak around saying, I'm not gonna take on more irrational risk. There is nothing weak around, uh, around saying, hey, this is no longer working. Um, the, the, the outcomes of entrepreneurship have every bit as much to do, probably far more to do with whether you get lucky than whether you're quote unquote strong or weak. And I just, I hate it when people get in front of entrepreneurs and they start equating strength with irrational risk-taking. Um, a, a similar thing, if you guys have ever watched the movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, it's, it's getting dated now, but for my generation, um, very popular Will Smith movie, fantastic movie. This guy goes all in to the point where he's literally sleeping in a bathroom, in a public bathroom with his son. Um, for the love of God, hedge your risks better than Will Smith does in this book. There is nothing glorious or romantic about putting you and your family's safety at risk for your entrepreneurial dreams. It's, it's a shitty way to think about it. Um, and again, I'd love to go deeper into this. I'd talk for an hour around that if you guys want. Um, I'm not even gonna get into this because I don't have time to talk about it. So um, preparation, your training plan. I'm gonna give you three minutes of training and then we'll take three minutes of Q and A. Um, it's critical to prepare, prioritize and adapt. You're in a dynamic environment. Um, I think there are four key skills that are incredibly important to develop if you want to be resilient to the challenges of entrepreneurship. Um, forgiveness, sorry, discernment, forgiveness, stillness, and presence. I just redid this deck for you guys. And so I kind of, I kind of lose my place sometimes. Um, key suggestions for you. So I'm going to go through each of these four skills. And I'm going to talk about how I suggest you think about building it. Build a team around you to keep you honest and to help you as you're going through the journey. Recognize it's going to be stressful and just be aware of it. 
Um, this can be a therapist. I highly, highly, highly suggest anybody who's an entrepreneur to have a therapist, somebody you can talk to on a weekly or biweekly basis about what's going on. Uh, executive coaches can fill this role. Uh, trusted friends. It can be your spouse, but oftentimes it's important to, to kind of have somebody who's maybe separate from that relationship. Um, business partners, peer groups, building and cultivating a team around you that you can be honest with, perhaps at different levels, um, but you can be honest with in different ways to support you is so important. Uh, making sure that that team has consistency, they're there for you consistently. They can help you contextualize the challenges you're going through and you trust them that what you're going through will be held confident, what you tell them will be held confidential. Uh, discernment, remember I told you that information processing uh, gets impacted as you go through all of this. Understanding, learning how to interrogate your emotions learning to separate the logical part of your brain from the emotional part of your brain. Um, one of the things that I do a lot is I journal. What is the thing that happens? What was the event? What is my emotion? So what emotion is that event causing in me? Um, and then how am I thinking, like, how am I responding to that? Learning how to sort of separate the thing that is actually happening from the way you feel about it is such an important skill to kind of keep things in perspective. Forgiveness, and this, this is one, again, that I'd love to spend an hour on. Um, it is, I think, the most subtle and nuanced part of all of this. But as we go through, as we go through the entrepreneurial journey, we so often end up beating ourselves up for the challenges and, and, and for the things that we face. Understanding how to separate yourself from your business. One of the exercises that I like to do is to rank myself my family and my business on a one to 10 scale and kind of th then explain why do I feel that way? For the longest time, I would never let myself be higher than my business was just implicitly. Like if my business was a seven, then myself couldn't possibly be an eight or a nine um, because I'd kind of conflated those two things to the point that I couldn't be happier than my business was. And so starting to decouple that, identify that and really come to terms with it, I think is so important as well as just being honest with yourself. Like what mistakes have you made? What failures have existed that you're still holding on to and you're still beating yourself up about? Um, again, working with that team we talked about in the last slide to figure out how you can move past that. Stillness. You know, Olympians train 40 hours a week. The key to rest, the, the key to performance is rest and recovery. Sleep, meditation, rest, recovery. Um, these are things that if you don't build that time in intentionally and allow yourself to do those things, you may think that you are still performing optimally. Every study in the world shows that you are not. For the same reasons that Olympians only train 40 hours a week, it's because if they go past that, then it gives them negative marginal returns. So, so, so think about you know, how to calibrate rest, recovery, and stillness into your kind of diet. Um, the, the final thing is presence. There is a ton of research um, out there that shows that, um, that, that being present in the moment leads to better decision making. Uh, I'm big on a gratitude journal, a celebration journal, celebrating the wins as you go through them, not constantly saying, okay, well, we checked that box. Now I've got 10 more things I have to do. Actually taking a breath, taking a moment um, and, and, and celebrating, you know, and being present in that moment when happy things happen. Um, Again, I could talk about this for forever. There are, there are great resources now that didn't used to exist. Founders First uh, is a fantastic research, resource out there with message boards um, and, and other kind of wellness uh, activities. Econa, um, which is started by, by my friend, Michael Freeman, another great resource for entrepreneurs on mental health. Um, YPO Vistage and EO can all be good resources as well. Uh, there are a bunch of great books and great authors out there. Deep Survival, um, the Stoics, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, Buddha, Jerry Colonna, Lao Tzu, Joseph Campbell. Um, I'm writing a book that's coming out in uh, a couple months that's all focused on entrepreneurial mental resilience. And if you guys want a free copy of this, um, I'm trying to get people to read it and hopefully uh, create reviews around it so that we can get the word out that it exists. So um, there's the website right there. I'm happy to send you a free copy of the book digitally if you're interested in taking a look at it. Uh, and then my blog, I talk more about entrepreneurial mental resilience. I got Twitter, I got email. Uh, you can hit me across the interwebs uh, if you got questions or thoughts.
All right. So, it is 559. You <laughs> I have a few head. more minutes. I don't have a super hard stop. So if anybody wants to hang out and, and do a little after hours, I can do that. for five minutes. Yeah, we have some time um, for anyone who's able to stick around for, for questions. And Eric, thank you so much for sharing your experiences in this conversation. And I think we're definitely going to have to have a part two to this because um, it was just so interesting to, to hear about and learn from your experience. Um, we have a question in the chat to start us off with. Um, so what is your advice um, for how you've handled the haters slash doubters on your journey, especially when those individuals are close family members, friends, or a spouse or a partner? I found that some people can't even relate uh, to or empathize with what I'm working on since perhaps that person might be more risk averse or just following a more traditional route or path. Yeah. So what would be your advice for yeah, that? Yeah, God, it's such a great question. Um, I, I, I at one point was dating a girl, uh, right as I was leaving IBM to start this, uh, I was dating a girl who um, she, she, would, she, would, she would have an emotional response to me even talking about starting a company. Uh, she was so risk averse. And, um, you know, it, it didn't work out between us, um, which is probably, you know, fairly obvious why. Um, that, and then there are other people. So, uh, you know, the, there were other people that, for instance, when I went to, uh, when I went to Mount Everest, people very close to me that sort of refused to acknowledge it was even happening, were furious with me for going, um, you know, they would, they would literally be angry with people that would like a picture on Facebook of, of me on the mountains because they felt like I was so irresponsible for putting myself at risk um, to go do stuff like this. And, and so, you know, those people exist. The, the other story that I'll tell you real quickly is when we finally exited Simple Relevance, I had one investor in Chicago, a uh, pretty prominent guy at the time. Um, he's, he's not doing a lot anymore, but he was pretty prominent at the time. And he, he didn't even want to take the exit because we didn't return capital to investors. And so he had sort of a nihilistic perspective of just burn the whole damn thing down and just declare bankruptcy. Because if I'm not getting money back, why the hell should employees get something out of this? And uh, as we were exiting, you know, he, uh, he told me that I was the most embarrassing decision and the worst investment that he'd ever made in his life. And, um, you know, there, there is a whole spectrum of people that will not appreciate the journey that you're on because of their own issues, because of their own issues with risk, because of their own issues with performance, um, because of their own issues with, with self-confidence. Um, now, on the one hand, there's, there's the delusions of grandeur phase when like truly well-meaning people want to give you advice that you should probably listen to that can actually be really, really hard to hear. And, and learning how to get past your own insecurities to actually hear the advice from well-meaning people is I think a really important skill. And for me, it was hard. And, and so that's something to cultivate and to try to get out there and listen to the haters um, who may not see your vision. And by the way, may be right. Like they, they may have feedback for you that, that you really need to learn and, and that you, you could serve to, to improve on. I, I think more than anything, there's there's a skill that that needs that, that we all have to develop around understanding why someone's giving you the feedback and the perspective that they are. And if it falls into the camp of really well-meaning, you know, good people that that are coming to you from a genuine place of wanting you to succeed and trying to give you feedback to help you do that, learning how to kind of get past your own defenses to listen to that feedback is really important. If it's people that are trying to take out their insecurities on you, um, either because you know they uh, they they you know they've got their own issues, I think understanding how to set boundaries, um, you know, and, and and how to get really comfortable saying like I appreciate your concerns, I have one life to live, and I'm going to go do the thing that I feel like I'm called to do or else I'm probably going to be really unhappy if I don't go do that thing. 
um, I think that also becomes an important skill to understand. And it's just, it, it gets calibrated differently depending on who the person is, right? Like the, um, and, 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 and how you do it, um, you know, just it's, 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 there's, there's nuance to it and there's an art to it. That's a great answer, Eric. I love how you spoke to the nuance of taking that constructive criticism and who we pay attention to versus not. Um, there's another question in the chat. Can you speak to how one steps into a second company after you've experienced all the symptoms of the first one? So I think what this person is asking, um, Eric, you've said you've started yeah. businesses that have failed. So yeah. how do you um, start again after you've, you know, had that experience? So, so full disclosure, so that I'm not a hypocrite, I have not actually founded a company and raised venture capital since Simple Relevance and since I've gone through most of this. I, I think I will again at some point. Um, you know, my, my journey has taken me, you know, to a, a few other places. Um, so, so I, I just want to put that out there as kind of a full disclosure um, so, so that, you know, everybody kind of understands. I do expect that I'm going to do it again. Um, I, I think it's going into it, having processed the experience before and being far more prepared the next time around, um, going into it, understanding that, you know, I need to have a team around me going into it, understanding that I need to prioritize myself and I need to prioritize my health and my happiness, you know, as I go through the journey. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think more than anything, it's, it's, getting through that process of, of kind of fully processing, fully metabolizing, if you will, the journey and some of the challenges that come along with it. Uh, and then going into the next one intentionally and with a set of tools and, and with a, a set of kind of heuristics and safeguards to make sure that the bad things don't happen again. Great. And I think we have time for just one more question if you wouldn't mind sticking around. Um, yeah. It's going to be my personal question, um, but uh, you talked that section of bad advice, you know, just hustle harder, just work through it, um, that type of uh, that advice that can be somewhat toxic. Yeah. How um, can someone uh, discern when they see there's all different types of resources online and um, people that are offering this advice? How can you discern what is sound advice versus um, something that might be like this more toxic behavior that you were talking about? Yeah. Um, so I, I've given a lot of thought to that. Like, like what's a heuristic? What's a lens that you can use to separate the good advice from the bad advice? I, I, I think that on certain tact, like, if I want to think about sort of tactics versus strategy, there are tactics around how do I do customer segmentation, tactics around how do I create a pitch deck that an investor is going to like. For a lot of those kinds of things, um, you know, what do I do with my cap table? How much equity do I give to a co-founder? You know, tactical questions um, around kind of really specific things. I, I think the entrepreneurial ad, advice industry does a pretty good job around like trying to understand some of those elements. Um, when you get into some of the deeper things, how do I make decisions well? How do I make decisions under uncertainty? How do I, um, how, how do I align human beings on a very difficult journey? When you get into what I would call the more strategic kind of questions, the best lens that I can come up with is finding old advice that has survived the, be the test of time. So the value of the learnings is oftentimes proportional to the age of it. Like if you want to understand how to manage our psychology on the journey, I'm trying to go back here. Seneca and Buddha and Marcus Aurelius with advice that it's thousands of years old. Lao Tzu is infinitely more inter is infinitely more useful than whatever shitty article TechCrunch is posting today around or like Gary V 
in terms of why you should go do more faster and, and hustle harder. Um, so, so trying to pull yourself out of the kind of media industry that exists right now and trying to read and learn things that have more ancient roots and things that have deeper wisdom. Because what happens is like back in the day of Buddha, I have no doubt there were also all kinds of other charlatans and idiots peddling all kinds of really shitty advice. And most of it rightly never survived to this day. So we don't have to think about it. And most of the stuff that's really old and survives to this day survives because it's really good and really valuable. Um, and, and so to some extent, you can kind of let let humanity, you know, sort of let, let the filter of time filter out a lot of the bad stuff. And it then increases the signal to noise ratio. Uh, I try really hard to not read stuff until it's been around for at least a couple of years, you know, not read books that are new other than scale your Everest. Of course, that's the book that you should read when it's new, but like, otherwise I try really hard to not read stuff that's new and coming out because it could be so easy to get caught up in like the zeitgeist of what's happening on Twitter and who's tweeting what to whom and like all of this other shit. And after it's been around for a while and kind of been able to distill for a while, that's usually when you can have a much better lens to, is it really valuable advice or not? Great, I love that answer. Um, thank you, Eric, so much for sharing your time and your experiences with us. And um, thank you to everyone for attending. Um, I do want to shout out to Shelby in the chat where um, Eric has generously offered a advanced um, digital copy of his book. So the link is there and I can also send out the link in uh, the e uh, email after this as well. Um, Eric, anything you want to say to the people before we sign off this evening? Well, again, thank you everybody for your time. The only thing I'll say is I noticed there's a, a 16 number here at the top around questions and things. If there are questions that we didn't get to, um, you know, tweet them at me, uh, and, and Shelby will be happy to make sure that I respond to those. Um, we also have a lot of these conversations over on the Founders First Forum, uh, and there's a free version of that. So I would encourage you, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions on that forum. You can email me questions as well, but I much prefer kind of doing the Q&A in a little bit more public setting. That way it can be useful to other folks. Um, and, and so again, tweet at me, uh, Founders First is a great place, um, or shoot me an email if you want. Great. Thank you, Eric. Um, and thank you to you all for joining us. And we will see you at our next workshop. Have a good evening. Thank you so much.